Today we're going to continue our study in um, Mark's gospel. We're going to read what we read last week because it actually sets up, but first we have to let the children go, <laughs> praise go, to Sunday school. So all the kids right now, just follow, okay, uh, Deborah, and uh, then we're going to get into the word of God. So as they're going right now, in Mark's gospel, chapter 2, verses 13 to 28, we're going to see that Jesus is, is actually stirring things up. He's stirring things up in the sense that for centuries, people were following the best they could, what they believed that God expected of them. And I'm talking about the Jews. He gave them an old covenant. A covenant is nothing but a legal contract. God said, if you do these things, okay, then I'll do, and I'll bless you, and I'll make you a holy nation. Now, the things that God gave the children of Israel to do were 613 laws, many of which were impossible for human nature to be able to do. Well, the people failed. But then, when Jesus came, he instituted a new contract with mankind, not like the old. And that is what Mark's Gospel, chapter 2, really through verse... Uh, 22 is all about. So let's look in what we read last week and then zero in today on the idea that Jesus said new wine must be put into new wineskins. We use bottles today, plastic, glass, glass is better, but back then a wineskin was something that they absolutely used to be able to uh, store wine and it had some properties that we're going to see that are very, very curious because you can't put new wine into these old wine skins. And there's a reason, and Jesus speaks it. In verse 13, then he went out again by the sea, and all the multitude came to him, and he taught them. This is Jesus. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he arose, and he followed him. Now it happened as he was dining in Levi's house that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many. and They followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Last week, we, we, we talked about if you were a tax collector and a sinner, and you hear Jesus say, I haven't come to call the righteous to repentance, but, but, but sinners, can you imagine the faces on the tax collectors and all these other individuals? They probably looked at Jesus like, are you talking about me? So we have the contrast between very religious people trying to do the best they can with this old covenant, and we have Jesus instituted a whole new thing, and he's actually fellowshipping with individuals that the old covenant said, you're not to fellowship with anyone unclean, anyone who's a sinner, and anyone, okay, who was exploiting any of the neighbors. In other words, that's what the tax collectors were doing. So with this contrast and tension between the old and the new is what Jesus is talking about. So then he goes on, and that's just the subject that we're going to talk about today in Mark chapter 2, verse 18 through 22. The disciples of John and of the Pharisees were fasting, and they came and said to him, Why do the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Again, a contrast between the old and the new. And they're wondering, what is this new thing that Jesus is bringing, this new kind of teaching? Now, we already saw in Mark's chapter, uh, Gospel chapter 1, 2, and 3, that this was a teaching with authority because Jesus was healing all of those who were oppressed of the devil and doing many miracles. So these attesting signs and miracles were convincing individuals that Jesus was not some normal human being down here and just a religious person. There was something about him because he taught with authority. So he had their attention, and this is what he says. 
Jesus said to him, can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. So he's talking about himself. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. Now, the disciples and everyone listening to him at this particular time did not know what Jesus was really talking about. It was what I call a delayed parable story that they would get the answer later on because Jesus knew he had to die on the cross for the sins of all mankind but this is the point that Jesus was making in this whole chapter about the old and the new and here we go verse 21 no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth in an old garment or else the new piece pulls away from the old and the tear is made worse and no one puts new wine into old wineskins or else the new wine bursts the wineskins, the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins. The difference between the old covenant or the old contract that God made with Israel, and the new contract he made with Israel and the whole world, is in the old covenant, which is you do these things, Things You do the Ten Commandments and all the rest of the 611 or 12 laws. If you do these, then I will be your God and you'll be my people. They broke the covenant. I mean, Moses didn't even get down from the mountain. And they were already breaking and violating. That's why he had to go up and get another one. You saw on Facebook where he was the first one to get a download from the cloud. You know, and he put it on a tablet. That was a little funny thing I saw on Facebook. But I'm bummed. Where's the drummer when you need him, you know? But I'm thinking about this unshrunk cloth for a moment. Think about it for a minute. Uh, when I go shopping for jeans, okay, usually I buy them all for the next five years if I get a good sale and I like them. That changes if I go up and down in my weight, which is usually happens. So I have a couple of different sizes depending on what decade I'm living, okay? But what I don't like is that jeans years ago used to be 100% cotton. And the problem with cotton is that if you try it on in the store, you're with me, right? You try it on in the store and it fits perfect, okay? You like it, it's, it's nice and snug. And then you wash them the first time, and they shrink maybe 2 to 3 or 4%. And you put them on. They're an inch shorter from you know, the, the ground, you know. And you're going, what happened? And you, you can't button them and stuff, but they look great in there. Why? It's because they shrink. So then they came out with pre-shrunk jeans. They were pre-shrunk. And in other words, they actually washed them first, and then they, they recalculated the size, and they sold them that way. For us individuals that are very, very healthy in the waist, it was very nice of them. <laughs> but now the latest thing is they have now 98% cotton and 2% either spandex or some other name, elastane. elastane. Okay, and they stretch. How many people like to stretch the new stretch stuff? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> That has made going out to eat wonderful. <laughs> you, ever no, you ever notice, well, maybe you ladies didn't, but uh, you know, I used to go out to eat, and I always, before the food came, would open up a notch on my belt, you see. Now they even have stretch belts, which is wonderful, okay? And I bought a couple of those, and they're marvelous, okay? And I had a friend once tell me, if you, uh, the problem with, when you are losing control of your weight, when you go to, what are those kind of jogging suit pants? They're dangerous. Because you have to tie them, and you don't know how big you're getting. And everybody else says, are you losing weight? You know, when they see you, because you're in jogging pants, and it looks like you're smaller, but you're actually getting bigger. Now, Jesus is giving this illustration, and every single person in Israel knew what this is all about because they were all drinking wine. They didn't want to drink water because they were afraid of bacteria and diseases and getting sick and everything else like that. They even knew about getting sick with dysentery and Montezuma's revenge back then. So they drank wine because it was fermented and it would, uh, fermented and it would last a lot longer. 
So when he was saying this in a parable, they were totally understanding what Jesus was talking about, the difference between the old contract with man and the new contract. I want to ask you a question. Which contract are you in right now? You say, well, I'm not in any of them. Oh, yeah, you are. If God does exist, he has a plan for mankind. He just didn't kind of make us, put us on this earth for no reason at all. But God wanted a family. He wants this family to be made in his image and in his likeness. And he gave them free will. The free will of man is very, very costly. Because if with the free will, you just continue to go your own way, and when we die and we stand before God, we have a problem. Because the gospel has gone forth, and that's the good news of Jesus Christ dying for the sins of all mankind. But if you die without Christ, according to the gospel, you cannot be with God forever in his family. Now that's in the Bible, so don't get mad at me if you're listening to me. This is in the scripture. Jesus himself said, you must be born again or you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And see, the problem that the Jews had in this particular time and religions down through these ages today is that they're trusting in the religion maybe they were brought up in. Some of the religions might be okay and they might pass muster when you get up to heaven if they had Christ as the center of the religion as fully God, fully man, of divine nature, suffering under Pontius Pilate. He died, he was crucified, buried, he rose on the third day. If we believe that Jesus Christ is the savior of the world and ask him to save us from our sins and to live according to his teachings, then we're granted eternal life now, not when we die. We can know that we have eternal life now. You see, the problem with many Religious people in the world today is they make a mistake in the sense that they think that if they live the best they can down here, that's all God expects. But the Bible is clear there are none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That negates this old legal contract from ever working. Because no one, the holiest of people in the Old Testament, Sinned at least once, twice, three times. It's not like baseball or softball. Baseball, you get three strikes, you're out. Softball, you get two, you're out. Okay? In God's kingdom, if you make the mistake one time, you're out. That's why Jesus came to die on the cross for our sins. Now, if you're listening and saying, uh-oh, what do I do? Well, just accept the new covenant. And the Apostle Paul told that the new covenant is not like the old one. Which the people break all the times. Which is, you got to live by all 613 laws that God laid down. No, none of the holiest men and women of God could keep those 613 laws. That's why Jesus came to institute a new covenant. And by the way, most uh, whether we're Catholic or Protestant, we all celebrate the idea of communion. There are different aspects to it in different uh, variations of, of uh, Christianity and the denomination, but the idea of communion has everything to do with the Last Supper and the instituting of this new contract. It's a new contract that the Father made with the Son by the Holy Spirit and we just receive the benefits of it if we believe. And we allow our sins to be washed in the blood of Jesus on the cross. And his spirit will come in and live in our lives. It'll be a one times one. Not a one plus one. But through us, Christ will live his life. And you're born again. You're a new creation. All the old things pass away and everything will become new. Sounds like a pretty good plan to me. But the word has to get out. You see, the old wineskin Jesus was referring to 
was the old covenant. And the new wine could not be contained by the old covenant. Why? It was because it was old. It needed a new wineskin. That's where we get in Ezekiel where the Holy Spirit said, he'll give us a new heart, a new spirit. He will place his spirit within our spirit. And we will follow the ways of God. Do you ever notice how hard it is sometimes to stop sinning? Whatever it is. No matter how much you try, you end up. I remember when I was a young boy and I, I went to talk to a, a priest one time. And I was having trouble with my conscience. And I said, I can't stop thinking about you know, disobeying my mother. I said, do you disobey your mother? No, but I can't stop thinking about it. I want to, but I love my mother so much. I don't want, but it's, it's a struggle in me. Why do I want to do this? I can't stop thinking about it. And I'll never forget what he told me. He said, okay, you know what a pink elephant is? I said, no, but it's, a, it's probably, you know, you're talking about some kind of a cartoon character. Okay, I want you to think about a pink elephant right now. Okay, okay, I got one in my, my mind as we're talking. He goes, now I want you to stop thinking about the pink elephant. I said, I can't. He said, well, that's the point. He said, the point is that you're always going to be focusing on things that you see with your eyes. And they're going to be desires that you have of your humanness. But did you ever notice that many of the human desires that we have, God says, I want you to curb these things. I mean, the hardest thing for me to do is to, you know, my dieting thing. Okay, I've been on a diet my whole life. Okay. That's what I like to say. I've gone up. If you didn't see me for 10 years, you go, oh, you're losing weight. I said, no, wait a minute. I was already up and down already, about 10, 15 pounds, but I haven't seen you in 20 years. You see? But the point is that we're tempted with food, and we're blessed in America. We really are. Travel the world as I did in, in well, not the world, but South America as a missionary many years ago in Colombia and Brazil, and you see the poorest of the poor. I've been in Haiti uh, as a missionary, and believe me, you, uh, you definitely thank God for American society. You do. Because we have restaurants that are absolutely incredible. And I've been in places, especially in Haiti, where they literally eat bugs off the ground. That's their, that's their M&Ms. Okay? And, uh, you know, it's like they even offered me one one time, a cricket, and I said, no, thank you. You know? They said, good. I said, no good for me. Okay? Praise God. So we're blessed in America, but no matter how hard we try to keep all the commandments of God, we're going to find ourselves always usually getting trapped up by one. In Hebrews, the, uh, the writer of Hebrews said, let us lay aside the sin and the burden that so easily entangles our feet. He was talking to believers back then. But we trust in the grace of God and the forgiveness of God in Jesus Christ to save our souls, not by our own works. Let me make an emphatic statement here, and it's true. It's a basic doctrine of Christianity when we understand the teaching of sanctification, which is the uh, after justification, which is we're justified by Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins. All of our sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. Doesn't mean we don't confess them anymore, but as we sin, we just keep confessing, and the grace of God comes, and our minds get renewed, and we start living more like God wants us to live. Now, it's very difficult to live that way in American society today because the mores and the values of American society are not the mores and the values that we find in the scriptures anymore. The Judeo-Christian principles that were the foundation of our society for the first 150 years, even though people weren't perfect, and of course, you can bring up the slavery issue. You can bring up the, the mistreatment of the Indians and everything else like that. That doesn't mean that God was wrong. It meant that people, okay, are still selfish and still self-centered and still have carnal ways in them and animalistic ways. Man likes to believe that he's a superior being on this earth. But in reality, he's built a house of cards because all of us are concerned about the evil that we see in the world and the ability for one person to get all of a nuclear weapon and start a war in which nobody will win, but yet that nut job would push the button anyhow thinking he could do it. 
As the Apostle Paul said that mankind is forever learning and never coming to a knowledge of the truth. And what is this truth? It's that man is a fallen creature. He's extremely intelligent. But at the same time, he can use that intelligence for evil or he can use it for good. That was Einstein's dilemma when he came to the idea of allowing EMC squared being used to be able to formulate the breaking of the atom. Because he realized that the danger of the power being released in that was not necessarily always going to be in the hands of people that had good intentions. But when I look in the Bible, down in the future in the book of Revelation, if there's anything good about the book of Revelation, I mean, it's confusing all the way up to the last couple of chapters because, you know, trying to figure out the beast and the false prophet and all these things that are happening and Satan vomiting out of hell, all these demon spirits coming all over and one third of mankind dying. I mean, it's enough to, it's like, it's like watching a, uh, what are the Infinity Wars or whatever like that, some kind of good and evil movie in science fiction, but this is supposed to be reality. So that would upset you, but if you look at the way end of it, the Bible says at the end, when the dead rise, and we all sit before the judgment seat of God, at Christ. The books are open. There's only two books. It's the book of life and the book of deeds. If your name is found in the book of life, then the book of deeds, all the bad deeds that we did when we lived our life are erased in the blood of Jesus. And then we are judged for the good things that we did and we receive rewards. But the biggest reward is with the name in the book of life, we have eternal life not only now, but forever and ever and we're in the family of God. And that's what God was doing down here, okay, on this earth. I mean, think of it. Why in the world have they not found any human life on any other planet? It's very simple. Well, it's not there for a reason. It could be somewhere if God wanted to do that later. In fact, well, I don't even want to get into the, the, the using your sanctified imagination when we inherit the whole of the universe. And each one of us maybe gets about a couple of galaxies to rule over, you know. Praise God. You think, da, 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 da. You think that that was fantastic when it came out in the 70s. Wait till you see what God has for you in the future if you accept his plan. And that's the whole thing, accepting his plan. With your free will, he's asking you, because he won't force you, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and become his disciple. And a disciple is nothing but an individual who's disciplined in the studies of someone else. It's not very complicated. We have four gospels that give us four eyewitness accounts of Jesus. And then we have, after Jesus rose from the dead, the book of Acts, which gives all of the actions of the Holy Spirit through the early church. You see how people that were intelligent or poor, rich, it didn't matter. They were coming to Christ and accepting the new legal contract, the new wineskin that God makes you. Some of us have had terrible experiences in the past. One of the scriptures in the beginning of my salvation experience, when I accepted Christ when I was 24 years old, I was an entertainer. And my whole band accepted Christ. Not because we were destitute with money. We were floating in money and popularity. I never made it famous. I'm talking about just a lo local professional musician who made his living, very good musician in New York back in the 70s. Figuring out how old I am. <laughs> Praise God. From eternity's perspective, I'm very young. Down here on this earth, I'm maturing, like fine wine, like some of you. You're looking pretty good for your age. Amen? There you go. We're, we're, we're just kind of like new wine in a new wineskin. You see, the new wineskin is actually a new creation. And the scripture that got me was, if any man or woman is in Christ Jesus, he's a new creation. All the old things pass away, and everything becomes new. 
In other words, he gives you a new heart that you can understand the scriptures. He starts to renew your thinking. And he starts showing you the way to live. It's difficult in the beginning, especially if we lived by the mores and the values of the world. When I got saved as a musician, you know, it was very common to just sleep around. Nobody got married. You have kids. You, you, if, you got, if you have a girl got pregnant, she just used it as birth control, and, and uh, that was it. Then it became the law of the land, and it, you know, it just became a form of birth control for some people. But the idea of just, you know, using people, that's just what the entertainment world is all about. Believe me, it becomes a plastic world. And everyone that becomes a star, whether they are in the movies or they're in the music world, in the beginning, wow, it's great, everybody's looking at me. And then five years later, you realize, you know what? They don't really care about me for who I really am. They care about what they see that I might be. And it's all plastic. And everybody in Hollywood and in the music world knows that everybody uses each other for their own selfish reasons. Now that particular understanding has assimilated down to the American culture. And many young girls have been hurt by the lines of men. And many men have been hurt by the lines of women. Because we use each other as human beings down here. This is what the world has come to in American society. And this is why we have such a terrible, terrible problem. Because man is just following his own desires like the lower animals are doing right now. Now what the lower animals do, they're following their instincts. But we are creating the image and likeness of God. And God asks us to deny ourselves. Take up our cross daily and follow after him. It isn't easy. But it is the only way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. You see, in the beginning, there is a change that has to take place. But God's grace and his Holy Spirit comes into your life and gives you the desire to be able to live for him because you actually fall in love with God. I am in love with God. I will worship God publicly and pray to God. Why? Because I love him. I'm not ashamed of him. It's very simple to see whether you're ashamed of God or not, or whether you're carnal, which means just human, following the dictates of American society, which mocks the things of God for the most part. Hollywood, the music world for the most part. There are few Christians, maybe two, three percent in the music world and in Hollywood, and they're always mocked. And what's raised up, all of the immorality and all of the cursing and all of the just do whatever you want to do. That's freedom. But it's not freedom, especially from the world I came from. And we had to learn the hard way that doing whatever you choose to do with all the money that you have and all the desires that rise up within you and the ability to buy people. And I'm not talking about men buying prostitutes. I'm saying just men buying women because women are looking for that individual who can take care of them or just have a good time with them. For as long as it happens. That's what groupies are all about. They follow movie stars. They follow musicians. My heart's desire is that I see a young generation rise up that does not have the, the problems that we have. Whether that happens or not, I'm not so sure. Because of the way things are going in society. But young people, listen to me right now. I feel like the parent talking to my kids or my, my mother talking to me, I know. Yeah, mom, okay. My mother was right, she wasn't wrong. I started out good. I was a nice kid, a goody two-shoe. My father used to say when I was nine years old, why don't you be like all the other kids? No other kid comes up. To his father at the end of the day, say, Dad, can I do any chores? <laughs> Dad, I want to cut the grass. You just cut it a couple of days ago, but I want to make sure it looks good. I want to do this for you. And I never forget my father. I said, what's wrong with this kid? Is he a nut? <laughs> then when I hit 12 years old, he said, why can't you be like other kids? You know, 
you know, I'm going to drop you off at the Holy Roller Church down the street. You're a nut job. My mother said, Joe, stop it. Just because he, he doesn't want to, you know, doesn't want to do any evil and he doesn't do it, he does everything that we ask him to do. You know, he's an A student in school. He doesn't do anything other than he loves God. The kid's a weirdo. Why don't you admit it? He's not normal. My father didn't know God. And he was running from the Catholic Church because he was abused as a boy. Back in the early 30s, he was an altar boy and he was abused by a Catholic priest. And he just said, you know what? They're full of baloney. He did get saved, though. He saw my life change. He wanted, to be a he wanted me to be a musician. And I became a musician, a professional musician, and a front man in, in a band back in the 70s. Never made it famous. I didn't want to be famous. I just loved being alone, making money, having a few friends, and that was it. Fame never really enticed me at all. Because I knew from an early age that it was all a facade. You're acting, that's all. You get up there and you boost everybody's emotions and you get them moving and you major in it, you study it, and it's an act. And believe me, there are quite a few musicians, if they really told you what you think about you people, okay? If you heard them speaking, what a bunch of jerks. They're paying 100 bucks to see us and we're a bunch of drug addicts and drunks. We have failed marriages. We don't take care of our kids. What the heck is wrong with these people? Yet, they play the act. Because it's an act. God has mercy on your soul. One day you wake up and you go, you know what? I realize this is an act. And I want to know the truth. If you really want to know the truth of why you Talk about individuals that while you were on this planet, the only way you're going to find out is going to God and saying, Jesus Christ, if you are the Savior of the world, and I am truly your creation, I want to talk to you. Don't do it in a nasty way because he'll just be silent. But if you humble yourself before him and say, I want to know God, if you truly exist, then please show me. I will guarantee you that he will show you. It's in the Bible, too. I'm just a spokesman. But he said, all who come to me in no way will I cast them out. That's why you hear about some of the most wicked people getting saved in prison. Some of the most horrendous people who've done things that you wish would still go to hell. But God forgave them for their sins. And as I close, I want you to think about this whole new agreement. It's the new wineskin. You can't make yourself a new wineskin. But God wants to make you brand new. And the old things will pass away and everything will become new. I tremble for the younger generation because the doors of listening to the voice of God are closing in our society at such a rapid rate that Christians are being mocked. And there's a lot of phony baloney in Christianity, and I truly agree on that. I think, I think some of the American Christianity is is nothing but a big show, entertainment, and money-making propositions. I'm discovering biblical Christianity, again, and has nothing to do with music, bright lights, cheerleading from the pulpit. It has to do with loving people deeply from your heart, forgiving those who have sinned against you, and trying with all of your heart and mind to be able to make some sense out of your existence down here on this earth to be able to help snatch others from the fire. And some of you mothers are trying to figure out how to snatch your children from the fire. I'm telling you, pray. Because they've been programmed in American society to be able to think like there is no God. Even if they say they believe in a God, all of their actions are just following the mores and the value system of American society which is being inculcated in them and assimilated into them by a godless education system. Hollywood, the music world, with the approbation of many in our government systems. That's the truth of the matter. 
Which do you want, the old or the new? The old is useless. It cannot produce life. The old wineskin, God can't take and put a Band-Aid on your carnal nature. That's why Jesus said you must be born again. In closing, you might be listening to me somewhere, here or on the Internet somewhere. But you've got to ask yourself a question. If I was to die today and stand before God, would he accept me or would he reject me? I can answer that question for you. It's not very difficult. Most people say, well, we don't know until we get to heaven, and God's going to add up the good things we did and bad things, and then he'll say, okay, you did more than good, so there, you did more good than bad, so there, I'll let you in. It doesn't work that way, because that's the old covenant. That's the old wineskin. The new covenant says this. When you stand before God, He's going to welcome you because your name got written in his book of life. The day that you asked Jesus to forgive you for your sins and said, I want to live as a real Christian, not a phony. I mean, I can teach a parrot to say the sinner's prayer. I don't mean parrots getting into heaven. It's how you live your life. You're willing to take up your cross daily and follow after Jesus. And that's an exercise in faith and failure. Success, failure, success, until the day we're taken home. But we know we have eternal life no matter what our failures are, even in the future as a Christian. And believe me, Christians fail. That's why some people say, you know what, I'm not going to church because it's full of hypocrites. Well, I got news for you. The church that's full of hypocrites are closer to God than you would be if you leave the church. Because if you're not going to become a Christian because they're hypocrites in the church, okay, I hear hypocrites a play actor, and all of us kind of like do that. You know, I'll leave you with this one thing because it's, it's so relevant, you know. It's like um, I see this picture of a household, and the, the husband is fighting over the kids because the kids aren't ready. You know, the windows are open, okay, and they live, you know, live down the street. And all of a sudden, the pastor's doing his morning walk, you know, and the windows are open in the summertime, and the woman's <laughs> yelling at the husband. The husband's yelling at the kids. They're going, this is your family side. This is the way they are. No, it's your family. These are your kids. They're your kids, too. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the pastor is walking by, and he sees the father there, and he goes like this. And then all of a sudden, the husband just changes him. Hi, pastor. The wife goes, is that the pastor? Hi, pastor. You see how quick we can change when we're motivated? It's just a simple de declaration of what we all are like. We can really put it on at times. But in this closing prayer, I'm asking you to not put on an act, but put on the reality and say to yourself, okay, if I do believe in God, Bibles say that's great, but the demons believe and they tremble. It's not just believing that God exists, it's receiving the New Testament and the New Covenant, the new gospel message, and becoming a new wineskin. Bow your heads and let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word today. We thank you for Mark who wrote these instances down, Lord. We started in the beginning with all these different kinds of people, Lord. They, they were Pharisees, religious people. They were sinners. They were tax collectors, which were considered the greatest of sinners because they were heavily taxing and being used by Rome as just an intermediary to collect the taxes from the Jews. And Father, we saw a lot of individuals just watching, the disciples of Jesus, and Jesus instituting this whole new way of living life, basically saying all your efforts to get into heaven are going to fail because you can't get into heaven because you have any sin in your life. You'll be apart from God forever. That's why Jesus has said, New wine must be put in new wineskins. In other words, the joy of the Lord, the powerful Holy Spirit comes into our life when we accept, we accept him as Lord and Savior. I'm going to give everyone listening to me right now an opportunity to get started. If your conscience is saying, wow, you know what? I really do believe in God, but, but if I need to have my sins totally forgiven and the Holy Spirit living in me, I've never really done this. I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray this prayer. I'll say a few words. You can repeat it after me. But if it's the prayer of your heart, the Holy Spirit knows. God knows if you're sincere. And then it's a start because a little crack in your heart, the entrance of thy word giveth light, the Bible says. And it will illuminate your conscience and start to
convince you more and more of your need for Christ to live through you. One times one, you and God forever. Let's pray this prayer together. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to forgive me for all of my sins. I believe that you died on the cross for the sins of mankind. I admit that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I can't save myself. Please save my soul. Grant me eternal life, O Lord. Fill me with your Holy Spirit that I might be able to understand your principles. As I read the Gospels and the New Testament, show me the way you want me to live. Help me to take up my cross daily. Follow after you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.